Hello everybody, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, and everything else. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there, uh, including me. Uh, my daughter has been here, actually. My eldest, my adopted daughter, is Lee Pritchard. She is here. She says, Happy Father's Day, Dad. Thank you. I hope you're still here and you're watching. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, let's see, Thomas was first in the door, very early, saying good morning, good morning to you Thomas, and Just Bob says hello everyone, Bill Shep is here, Just Bob, Mike Neighbor, hey Mike, good to see you buddy, is here, Kyle is here, David is here, John Lake says back in Vero Beach, hot hot hot, hey John, how you doing, and Lowens is here, <laughs> Hi Lee, how you doing? So, uh, it is Father's Day, so I'm not expecting a particularly large crowd to be gathering here today. So, uh, with that in mind, we'll probably make this just a shorter show because I don't want to tear you away from your families because Father's Day is an important day uh, for our families. So, um... For me, it's over, it's all done and dusted, it's five past midnight here in Scotland, so, uh, you're not tearing me away from anything, but I know over there, the other side of the Atlantic, um, it is probably dinner time, or coming up towards dinner time, and you'll be wanting to have your family dinner, so, I'm not going to keep you away from that, so we'll keep this a short one, and as I say, I'm not really expecting much of a crowd, so, uh, I think what we'll do is we will, uh, because it's Father's Day, we'll make this just a Q&A session for today. Nothing special um, other than just answering your questions for maybe about half an hour, and we'll see how it goes. And uh, if we get if we, if we we get like 20, 25 people here, then we'll keep going for a little bit longer. But, um, but yeah, happy to deal with Studio One questions today. Uh... That would be awesome. That would be the show for today. And then next week we will um, we'll do something completely different. Um, I will be demonstrating some uh, different things and going over some older stuff that we've not been over for yeah, maybe a couple of years um, because I have quite a different audience now than I had back you know, in 2018, so I think maybe uh, it would be good if I covered some of the stuff that I covered a couple of years ago, um, just to just to cover that stuff. So, you know, maybe we'll do some uh, uh, shows on compression, we'll do some shows on EQ, uh, and maybe we'll also go through this the native plugins that come with Studio One, for those of you guys that are brand new to Studio One. Uh, we can do that as well. So uh, get your questions in, guys, because this is going to be a short show. So be typing furiously and quickly, and I'm happy to answer all your questions. I have the piano on here, so we can do music theory and songwriting questions, harmony questions. We can do those as well. So wait, tons of reverb. There we go. Uh, so yeah, so we can do that kind of stuff as well. Studio One is, is available to you guys as well for Studio One questions. So get your questions in. And we'll make it that kind of a show today. Refreshing the brain is always good. It most certainly is. Yes, um, definitely there is value to repeating things because um, it helps to reinforce things that you've already learned. And uh, that is always a good thing. Uh, when I was a high school teacher, it was a teaching technique I made use of quite a bit. So, because it is important um, to go back over things and, to, uh, you know, it may well be for some of us that we've got ourselves into some bad habits. And, uh, you know, it's good to unpick those and learn the, you know, the, the better way to do things. Um, so, yeah, we can certainly do that. Bobby Booth is here. No Sunday Night Live is complete without Bobby Booth. So, Bobby, very glad to have you here, my friend. And uh, Bobby is a great mixing and mastering engineer. You should avail yourselves of his services for sure if you've got a record coming out. 
um, or a single, um, definitely go and avail yourself of Bobby's mixing and mastering skills. He is superb. Uh, and he keeps on winning mixing contests. So uh, definitely go check his skills out. And uh, Bobby has been a loyal supporter of mine and of Johnny Gibes and uh, Dave Vignola's for a long time. So, <laughs> John Lake says, does 200 pounds make me a large crowd? <laughs> yeah, a crowd tends to be more than one person, but, yeah, no. <laughs> Just Bob says, Father's Day has no meaning when you haven't any kids and your father passed. It really is depressing, a reflection of how life doesn't always turn out how you want. I'm afraid that is also very true. And for those of you that have always wanted to be fathers and, you know, life and circumstances have meant that you haven't been able to to uh, to achieve that, then, you know, today, I, I, I think today is for you guys as well. You know, for those of you that are actual fathers with children, uh, it's important. But also for those of you that have never been able to have children for whatever reason there is, and there may well be many and various reasons why life has meant that you have not been able to, to have kids. And, you know, even though that might be very much something that has been in your heart, that you've always wanted to have kids. So for you guys, I think Father's Day is, is important for you too. Um, and it's important that we acknowledge you folks as well and uh, give you guys some value and some credence as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, Bob, that's an extremely important point, and I appreciate it greatly. Um, and I understand, I understand, you know what it what it can be like. So um, yeah, I am here for you as well as those that have children. Just so you know. Alrighty, we have eighteen people here, which is much larger crowds than I was expecting, so so that's cool. Alrighty, so get your Studio One questions in, folks. Otherwise, this is going to be a very, very short show. If we have no questions, then I will end the show. And this could be a this could be on course for a record shortest show that I have ever done. And I would not like to have that record. <laughs> Because I always look forward to my Sunday Night Lives, and I always look forward to talking to you guys, and um, I always um, enjoy you guys challenging me with your questions. So, uh, absolutely. Uh, but if there are no questions, and you guys, um, you know, you guys are comfortable with your skills and comfortable with what you do, um, and, you know, where you are and where you would like to go with music making, with recording, mixing, and mastering, uh, then, yeah, for sure. Uh, that's okay if you don't have any questions. David says, since I'm a Reaper user, I have no questions. Okay, you might not have any Studio One questions, but do you have any mixing and mastering questions and... Questions about the music business, questions about uh, recording, and that kind of thing in general. You can, you know, you are welcome to post your questions as much as anybody else. I say Studio One because that is what I use, and uh, but you know, I tend to make everything that I do here on my channel um, pretty much. Uh, I try, I try to make everything that I do as a you know applicable to any DAW. Uh, Lee says, do you have any advice on production blocks? Do you mean kind of like songwriting blocks, those kind of things where, uh, you, you are in one of those periods where everything you touch seems to turn to poop? Uh, yes, I do have advice for that because I have been through those and they do happen periodically for most people. Um, and there are definitely ways through them. And definitely ways around them and there are some good ways through and there are some bad ways to approach a period where you have a block 
be it a writer's block or just a patch where you know every song you mix just doesn't seem to come together you know very well uh and uh i think i think the all-encompassing principle with a writer's block or a, a mixing block or you know whatever a creative block is perseverance I think you just have to push through and you have to keep creating regardless. My friend Rob Mazies, who is a fantastic educator and uh, mix engineer in his own right and has a fantastic YouTube channel and uh, a great business called uh, Musician on a Mission. You, should, you, you guys should all go and check out what he does and the courses that he creates because they are awesome. But... Um, his tagline is create regardless. And, you know, I, I love that little tagline. I wish I had come up with that myself personally. Uh, but I think that's the best way through any mental block with creativity is to create regardless, even when you don't feel like it, even when you, f you don't feel inspired, even when you don't feel motivated. The best thing you can do is create regardless. And so what I tend to do uh, as a songwriter in particular is I schedule when I'm going to write songs. That's right. I actually schedule it, schedule it, however you want to pronounce it. I have a plan and it's on the wall calendar, the family wall calendar. I am working on songs at this specific time on these specific days and even if it means nothing comes out of those writing sessions it doesn't matter what matters is that i block that time out and i spend time working on songs and even if nothing comes out of that session it doesn't matter it means that i have blocked that time out and it is essentially a job that i am doing you know because if I sit around and wait for the muse, whatever that is, to strike me, or inspiration to suddenly come upon me mysteriously from the ether, from wherever, I could be sitting there waiting forever. You can find inspiration in an abundance of places and an abundance of things. You know, if, if you're struggling for lyric writing uh, then the best thing to do is to read lyrics of songs that you know are fantastic and songs that inspire you songs that you know that you that you like to sing uh, and that you like to listen to read their lyrics listen to those songs and spend some time picking them apart and and looking at what makes that song work uh, and you will find that, that by doing that, you will be encouraged and inspired to start, you know, something, something new yourself. That works for me. If I'm struggling for lyrics for a song, I'll go and pull out the sleeve notes, uh, the liner notes for a Sting record or uh, a Steely Dan record or, um, you know, a Gershwin song. And I will just read the lyrics and look at what makes that song really, really work. And I'll go, okay, for this song, it's the rhyming scheme. Or for this song, it's the humor that really makes this song stand out and, and you know, uh, stay in my head. Or it's, it's the mood of this particular song that engages me uh, and draws me into it. And so going through those things... Uh, can actually get you back to working on making music. So persevere, um, schedule, plan when you're going to be working on music. Don't wait for inspiration to come because it may not. Uh, you know, a lot of the best creative people they 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 do it as they do it as as a job. You know, it's not just that they are doing it full time and they're, you know, 
they get paid to do it. It's that they they do it as a job. Like, you know, if you work in an office, you attend your office from nine till five, Monday to Friday. And so a lot of great songwriters, that's what they do. Monday morning, 9 a.m., they are in their studio and they are sat and they are and they have their DAW on, they have the notepads out, they and they just start to write and they start to, you know, play around with chord changes and that kind of thing. You have to make things uh you know, you have to make things repeatable and uh so that you can develop your craft. Because at the end of the day, you know, the creative arts, for as much as they are about creative creativity, they're also uh, a skill set that need to be developed and honed and worked on. And so keep, you know, you have to just keep being creative, regardless of whether you feel like being creative or not. And, so, and something always good comes of that. So, Leah, I hope that answers your question. Common Ground says, uh, I have a Studio 192 interface and have set up QMix set to lock in with the mixer. Muted tracks are not muted in the headphone mix. Appears to be a bug. Any thoughts? Worked with Studio One version 3. Well, I don't use that particular interface and I don't tend to use QMixes. Suffice to say, um, the way QMixes are designed in Studio One is that they are meant to be flexible. So you can mute tracks in the regular mixer and not have them muted in your QMix and vice versa. Um, because the whole idea of QMixes is to be able to send a separate mix from your main monitor mix to different musicians. Um, so uh, it should still work in version four. Um, but I tell you what the thing to do, uh, if you think it's a bug is to write down the steps to reproduce it, to reproduce the issue, uh, and log a support ticket with it. And then either myself or one of my other colleagues in support will um will get to look at it you can also send us a song file as well we don't need the audio we just need your song file and uh when you send that to us we can have a look at the setup and how you're using qmixes and we can see whether um it is a bug or whether it's a user error because hey we all make mistakes we all do things uh we all do things wrong from time to time so uh, yeah, we can look at that. So log, us, log a support ticket with Persona support and we'll take a look at that. Just Bob says, oh, he's talking to Bobby Booth. Glad you understand. Sorry, that's how it worked out for you. Life throws curveballs that no one sees coming. Yeah, unfortunately, life definitely does do that. I have experienced my fair share of them. Uh, let's see. John Lake says, does the fastest Thunderbolt serve solve the delay problem? I believe you're referring to latency when you say delay there. Um, the fastest Thunderbolt device that Personas makes is the Quantum. The Quantum has a round trip latency of less than one millisecond. And this has been uh, tested. So it's not just something that we boast about. It is something that has been tested and confirmed. So, but a latency exists and latency is an issue. Um, but latency for the most part is not to do with the DAW. It's usually to do with the speed of your processors your computer. Uh, and that's usually how latency for your system is determined. Um, there are various ways in which you can compensate for latency, one of which is to make use of the dropout protection uh, low latency system in Studio One that was introduced in Studio One 3.5. So you can definitely uh, make use of that, and by doing that, you can reduce your standard latency, 
your standard round trip to something that is a lot more manageable because the way the audio engine was redesigned when we introduced the low latency monitoring path was that we created two separate pathways in the audio engine. We created a, a so you had a recording pathway and a playback pathway. And they were essentially two completely separate pathways. And what this meant was um, the computer would be processing one or the other independently. And, and that meant that the, the whole round trip thing was much, much faster. And still is. So there is a hardware late, uh, low latency monitoring path and a software native low latency monitoring path. And um, that's denoted by either a blue Z on your master fader or a green one. If you have the green one, it's because you're using Studio One's low latency monitor monitoring path. Uh, and if you get the blue one, it's because you're using the DSP um, monitoring on your hardware interface. So uh, the Studio Series interfaces will do that, and the Quantums will do that as well, the 2626, and the Quantum and the Quantum 2 will all do that as well. So, yeah, you can definitely set those up. Bobby says, as long as I've been mixing, it's always good to start all over, like gain staging, static mix, and using stop plugins. Yeah, certainly, for time, from time to time, it's always a good thing to go back and just say, hey, I'm going to do a stop plugin mix, and I'm not going to touch any third-party mix, uh, third-party plugins. Definitely. I, I did that for a, pro for a prolonged period of my mixing career, uh, where I just basically set aside all of my third-party plugins and did everything for all of my clients, using the um, using native plugins, whether that was on Cubase, because I was on Cubase for a lot of years, um, or on Studio One, once I had actually switched over to Studio One, uh, way back when it was Studio One 2, Studio One 2.5. That's where I, I first started with Studio One. So back then, uh, I just used the native Studio One plugins. I didn't bring any of my third-party plugins across. Uh, and then it was probably 2016, 2017, maybe, when I started um, bringing my Waves plugins back in. And then I got the Slate Digital Bundle. Don't have that anymore. Um, and I got rid of actually a good number of my Waves plugins because they were not able to update them. So... Um, uh, so I got rid of most of my Waves plugins. I have maybe only two or three now. And for the most part, I use Plugin Alliance plugins. For the most part. And they are amazing plugins. Uh, I use them a lot. Let's see. Mike Naval says, I've just been playing drums and setting up my kit and making samples. I still do music every day. A new computer that doesn't crash regularly has been my recent inspiration. Yeah, you've, um, you've had some considerable issues with your computers of late, but I'm glad that you now have a system that is stable, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I've had a couple of computers in the last five years. My old one, which is a Windows 7 machine, is now sitting over here, the other side of the piano. Uh, and that was a really, really stable, solid computer for about five years. I think I, think I had one blue screen of death in those five years, just the one. Um, and the rest of the time, Studio One, I think, crashed twice. And that was actually caused by a Waves plugin, which I then went and uninstalled and reinstalled, and that fixed the problem. And I didn't have any more crashes after that. So it worked, it worked really, really well, but unfortunately, the components of my old computer were not 100% Windows 10 ready. So... Uh, I had to get rid of that computer. And I now have a fantastic new Windows 10 machine, uh, which is only about uh, five months old. And working really, really well. Super solid, super stable. And Studio One runs on it like a dream. Let's see. Mika Han is here. He says, hello all. I hope everyone is well. Good to see you, Mika. Welcome. 
Uh, let's see. <laughs> My neighbor says, I find it was a new set of drumming socks as well. <laughs> and yes, the Quantum is super fast. It has got to be one of the fastest Thunderbolt uh, interfaces on the market, if not the fastest. I'm pretty sure that it is, in fact, the fastest. Mika says, Studio One is so flexible that one can simply use sends to buses that feed your various headphone out slash queue mixes. The sends can be set pre or post, plus queue is not available for buses, whereas sends are. Good point. Uh, uh, queue isn't available for effects channels either. That is also a good point. Um, I don't use queue when using Studio One. Mike Neighbor says, I have a Studio 192, but record MIDI mostly now. Never used QMix that much. Yeah, not everybody does. Um, and to be honest, I don't have that many musicians come in um, to my, my studio. Um, I, certainly don't, I certainly do not have bands in here. I don't have enough room for a band, but um, I've, I've certainly had a, a folk trio in here. That's one thing I have had is I've had a folk trio in here and doing uh, using Qmixes for, for that scenario with the Studio 1824 worked wonderfully well. Um, yeah, those worked really, really well in Studio One, Studio One 4.6. So I certainly haven't had any issue with Qmixes. Um, but as I say, I don't use them very often. <laughs> uh, Snidely Whiplash is here. Hello, good to see you. He says, Waze Factory has a free tape stop plugin that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've heard good things about that. Uh, plugin Alliance says Just Bob is a great VST company. Yeah, they make some of the, the best plugins around, and actually their bundles are really, really good. Uh, and actually, arguably, are better than the Slate Digital Bundle. Arguably, in my opinion. The channel strips are, I think, better than the ones you get with Slate. Oh, I forgot to turn off my notifications. That was silly. I'm going to do that right now. Uh, 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 notifications, where are you? Notifications, turn off. There we go. That shouldn't happen again. Uh, let's see. My neighbor says, I got rid of all my Waves plugins for the same reason their update policy is a joke. Yeah, it's not great, unfortunately. Uh, I tend to agree. Which is a shame because Waves have, you know, industry-wide, they have such a great reputation. Uh, and yet their updating policy sucks. <laughs> Uh, Bobby says, fixing to get rid of my Waves plugins and stick with Plugin Alliance ones also. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. I have, I think, one reverb. I have the true verb from Waves, and that is pretty much it. And so really, for me, my favorite Waves plugins that I had were, were the Abbey Road J37 tape machine. Loved that thing. Can't use it anymore, unfortunately, because it wouldn't it wouldn't update. Uh, the noise suppressor, the NS1, was really really good for doing um, audiobooks and podcasts and uh, voiceovers that I do as well. Couldn't do any of that. Couldn't do it with that. So now I just use uh, the Studio One Expander actually, and I get pretty good results with that. So. Arguably, don't really need the uh, the noise suppressor. Arguably, um, but yeah, if if one of you guys out there can point me to another kind of noise suppressor similar to the NS1 that would do the job, then please do post uh, in the chat where I might be able to get one of those, and I will go and take a look. Um, but as I say, I use the expander, and it works just as well. Uh, let's see, Just Bob says, my one terabyte hard drive is split, 2575 C, C and D drives. How do you move third-party plugins to the D drive and let Studio One recognize them? My C drive is almost full. Yeah, partitioning uh, is not necessarily something I recommend, personally. You will find that there may be other people that recommend it. I don't. 
I recommend that you have a dedicated C drive that has all of your software applications on it and your operating system. And then you have a second dedicated drive, which is for your songs and your projects. So that's where all your song files are stored. That's where the media and the image data and the, the you know, all of that stuff that goes with each song, those go on your second drive. Um, so on your C drive, you would have Studio One, you would have all of your plugins, and you would have your operating system. And everything else, your songs, go on your other drive. So personally, I recommend that you stick with keeping your third-party plugins on your C drive. And if you've got um, a space problem, you're probably just going to have to clear out some applications that you just don't use. Uh, anymore. That's what I would recommend if you know if you've got like one terabyte and it's practically full um, Additionally if because the way you're talking about it you're talking about you've partitioned the drive and so the 25% of the drive which is your operating system that 25% is almost full uh, Then yeah, you're probably gonna have to cut some applications that you don't use very much anymore but I would keep your third party plugins on the C drive and not on the D drive. However, if you do decide that that's where you're going to put them, the issue you're going to have is where Studio One uh, goes to scan those plugins, which is why the architecture, the hierarchy and the architecture for Studio One um, is that for VST plugins, it has a VST plugins folder. And that's where it goes to look for all of your plugins. That's where the plugin scanner goes and, and looks. Um, so personally, I think it is the best way is to have um, a dedicated drive uh, for your operating system and your plugins, and then a second dedicated drive for your song projects. Just Bob says it came that way from the manufacturer. Yeah, I had an old computer that did that too. Uh, and that computer did not last very long. Uh, I'm not saying that yours is going to be like that, but mine certainly was like that, where this, the partition drive just did not last very long. Um, so my recommendation is to you is to um, see if you can figure out a way um, to be able to unpartition it and get yourself a, an external drive, an external USB hard drive, and move your songs to that external hard drive so that all you have on the other drive is your operating system, Studio One, and your other applications and your plugins. So that's what I would recommend. Uh, D Sound Recording Studio says libraries could be on another drive and easily backed up. Yes, they absolutely could. And I have that as well. I have sample libraries and I have loops and they are, exist on another hard drive. And all you need to do to set that up is you just need to, um, uh, for the most part, if it's samples that are like one shots or they're loops, then you can you can access them directly from the browser. There's a very very nifty little way of doing that called new tab from here. So when you're in the browser tab and you're in the files section, you navigate through the files section to the drive where your loops are and then you click on that loops folder and you well you right click that loops folder and a little drop down menu appear appears and you choose the option new tab from here and what that does is that puts a new tab for that specific folder up at the top so when you when you're on the files tab in the browser underneath that you'll have your your tabs for that files section and so you'll be able to very quickly access it i can show you that let me just get studio one up and going and I can show you how I have that set up and I think I've done videos on this before um, but yeah it's definitely something well worth um, looking into doing for those of you that have sample libraries and loop libraries and those kind of things 
um, or other sound libraries maybe um, where you can easily access them that way so uh, let me just set this up just a minute okay I'm going to go over to OBS and we're going to go over to Studio One. So what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the Files tab up here. Uh, there's my Sound Sets folder, which is, by the way, another way that you can get to your Sound Sets uh, and make sure that they're all there. Uh, if you're not sure where they live, that's one place that they actually live. Uh, so yours would probably look like this when you first open it up. So where you'd need to go is files and then volumes. And then when you open that, there's your C drive. Um, and there's your users folder. So you go to there next, then you go to uh, your users, your user profile. There's mine there. And then I have access to my Dropbox here, which is great for my client stuff. Um, which is great. But you'll notice up at the top here, I have three tabs under this files hierarchy. I have files, Studio One, and then I also have Loop Loft. Loop Loft is, uh, I have a whole bunch of drum loops and saxophone loops and all sorts here. And I can access all of those from here and I can, I can drag them in. So for example, let's say we decide for a particular song, we want this guy in the song. And that clipped massively because that is very, very loud. All right, so let's say I'm, I'm recording a song and that's the, the drum loop that I want. This is from my Matt Chamberlain drum library, uh, which you can get from Loop Loft. Uh, there are two libraries. There's Matt Chamberlain Drums 2, Matt Chamberlain Drums 1, and there's they are in all sorts of cool uh, styles. You've got audio, and you've also got MIDI loops as well. So I can go in and I can grab any of these MIDI files as well and just bring them in, and I can have any impact kit or any contact kit play these particular, these particular sounds, um, which is very, very cool. So yeah, so I have all of these on this little tab here. And basically how I how you do that is you go back to your files tab. Um, let's close up Dropbox for, for just a minute. And I went to one of my external drives. So I've got several here. So, you know, I could go to this drive here and I could go to, let's open this one here documents, documents, and let's see, there's my loop loss right there. So what I did when I did that was I right click this folder and then you go down to here where it says new tab from here and you click that and then it creates a new tab at the top here. So I have file studio one and loop loft, uh, loop loft loops. All right. So it is as easy as that. All right, so I hope that helps, guys. And we are going to go back over here. And we're going to see. I hope that that, that helps. Uh, James R says, and another drive for samples. Yes, absolutely. You can definitely do that. Uh, 911 a day says, apologize. If off topic, I realize the term mastering is a vast statement, but is there a third party option you might recommend to get close for uploading to iTunes, Spotify levels? Yeah, actually I can. What I recommend, and it's not really a mastering plugin or anything like that, although it could be, there is a, a, a site developed by a wonderful mastering engineer. He's one of the best in the business. Uh, he's also a good friend of mine. His name is Ian Shepard. And he developed a website called loudnesspenalty.com. You can go there and what you can do is you can um, uh, 
uh, you can upload your file, your your mastered file to that site. And it doesn't store your music. All it does is scans your music and listens to it. And um, what it spits out is the um, how that song would be um how it would sound on the top five streaming services so and that would include youtube that would include itunes that would include spotify and all of those according to those sites loudness management policies now most of these uh sites um have a policy of minus 14 lufs although some have minus 13 lufs and what that happens is when your audio crosses that point, um, the limiters built into those streaming platforms will turn down your music. And what loudnesspenalty.com does is it allows you to see how much your music would be turned down by those, by those platforms were you to upload that mastered file right now to Spotify or to iTunes or to pandora or to wherever uh that's what that website does and it tells you by how much it would turn it down in in uh, terms of db so the idea is that you want your music to not be turned down by very much if at all preferably not at all um and, pre and maybe even actually turned up a little bit so if you have a a loudness penalty uh a loudness penalty uh number of let's say minus four then what that means is that one of these you know one of these particular streaming sites is going to turn down your music by 4 db and they're going to do that by applying limiting and what's that going to do to your music well what that is going to do is it's going to reduce the dynamic range of your music by 4 db so what do you do to address that what you do to address that is you go back to your master and you maybe kind of uh adjust it a wee bit so that when you then go and upload it to loudnesspenalty.com again that number is a little bit closer to one or zero or even being plus one uh so yeah that's kind of what you want to try and aim for it is available as a plugin from masterplugs.com i believe it is so you can get the loudness penalty plugin and you can put it as the last thing on the post of your master fader or the the, the post of the master section in the project page you can do that and it will tell you right there and then inside studio one what uh your loudness penalty values are going to be so that is something i definitely recommend bobby says if you have any zip folders on your hard drive move them to an external hard drive they use a lot of space that is a good good point tony says can i have your computer specs what mine or somebody else's uh mine i am using uh and hang on i got an itch that i need to deal with there we go uh, I am using a an i7 um, 8 core CPU uh, which has a speed of 4.5 gigahertz and I uh, I have 16 gigs of RAM and uh, when I'm running everything flat out when I'm running like 10 tabs of Chrome 10 ta tabs of um, Microsoft Edge and Studio One and Skype uh, and WhatsApp <laughs> and OBS. Uh, my my RAM gets up to about fifty percent, and my CPU gets up to about four <laughs> percent. So it doesn't really break a sweat for anything that I do. And when I'm mixing, I can be, I can easily do 100, 150 tracks of audio with um, Plugin Alliance and Studio One plugins all over the shop. 
and the computer will just not even get close to being out of breath, <laughs> frankly. So, yeah, I hope that helps. Tim Talks is here. Good to see you, Tim. How are you, my friend? He says, sorry I'm late. Yeah, you know what? This this isn't school, man. <laughs> but that's cool. Uh, Mika says, keep in mind that the smaller the SSD and the smaller the partitions, the faster it will wear out. That's absolutely great advice. That's spot on. Uh, Bill Shep says, the plugin Isotope Ozone 9 helps a little with mastering EQ and levels. Yes, it does. Ozone 9 Elements has a f has fewer features and costs less. It does. Uh, and is better than just using a limiter. Yeah, in some cases that is that is definitely true um, for everything else. Um, uh, for everything else, there is everything that is already inside Studio One. Uh, Tim says, I think it's important to say that you should master to the services that you should... I think it's important to say that you should master to the um, services target level. You should master the song so it sounds its best. Completely agreed. The streaming services can and will adjust the volume of your tracks to get all tracks close to the same if you have that option enabled. But you shouldn't master to minus 14 LUFS. You should master the song so it sounds awesome. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And Ian would absolutely agree with that as well. But the reason why he created Loudness Penalty is so that people would know by how much their music is going to be turned down by the streaming system, by the streaming uh, platforms so they know how much their uh, dynamic range is going to be lost by, you know, putting out something that is excessively loud. Really, in this day and age, at this point in 2020, there is absolutely no reason for masters that are excessively loud with uh, no dynamic range. There just really isn't. The dynamic range war is over. It's done and dusted. Um, and really, dynamic range is what wins, uh, to be really honest. Um, and, you know, pretty much everybody is beginning to realize that. The streaming platforms are realizing that. TV and radio are realizing that, that there's just no, you know, there's no point in everything being as loud as, as possible. Because, let's face it, music is dynamic. The best music that people engage with the most has dynamics to it. There is a contrast between loud and soft. You know, some of the best music ever written has a dynamic range. There are louds, there are softs. And uh, I think that's important because otherwise the listener's ear will get fatigued very quickly if... Uh, the music that you put out there has a very, very small dynamic range. Now, obviously, this is going to be a little bit genre-specific. There are some styles of music that are just loud. Uh, and, you know, they don't have much of a dynamic range. Um, so you have to find contrasts in other, in other areas. But to, you know, to ensure that the listener's ear is not going to get fatigued. For sure. Um, but yeah, the best music that has ever been written has a dynamic range. Uh, and actually, arguably, some of the best music that's ever written and most success, most commercially successful music um, that's, ever, that's ever been written, that's ever been recorded, is music that has the largest dynamic range. Uh, so... You know, there's, you know, there's absolutely no the rhyme or reason to put music out there that has a dynamic range of four. You know, a, a DR value of four. Uh, Ian goes into great, great lengths about this on his website. So, you know, if mastering is your thing and mastering is the thing that you are maybe struggling with the most, go and check out his website, which is www productionadvice.co.uk go and check out his site and you will find a ton of stuff on there about mastering and you'll have a you'll find a ton of stuff on there about loudness and you'll have a ton of stuff in on there about dynamic range and how to get the best out of your masters 
uh, to ensure that your dynamic range is um, preserved when you export your music to the world, which is the important thing. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you're welcome, 911 a day. Absolutely. My good friend, Saar, is here. Hello, mate. Good to see you. He says, artists and producers haven't realized it yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid you're absolutely right. <laughs> they probably will be the last to, uh, to realize that, I think. I think you're absolutely right. Bill says, Bill Shep says, the volume wars still exist on uh, TV commercials when we still have commercials. Yeah, and the reason why... <laughs> Here's the interesting thing. Why are TV commercials louder than the actual programs? Anyone got an idea? I'll tell you why. The reason why they are louder is because during the commercial breaks, most people get up to leave the room. They'll either go to the kitchen to make a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or to go and get a snack or they'll go and use the bathroom. So they turn the volume of those commercials up so that you can still hear them when you're in the kitchen or the bathroom. That's why commercials are always louder than the programming. I know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but that's the way it is. So yeah, I don't necessarily think that that's anything entirely to do with uh, loudness wars, but yeah. Uh, Snidely says, have you ever listened to Genesis albums? So very dynamic. They most definitely are. Absolutely. And yes, I have listened to some Genesis records. I, I, will, I was quite, I was a bit of a Genesis fan. Um, you know, they're, uh, they're a great band. And uh, they had two really, really great songwriters um, in Phil Collins and uh, Peter Gabriel involved with them as well. They wrote some great songs. They made some great records. And uh, some of those records were mixed by Hugh Pageant, I think. And some of them might have even been mastered by him as well, quite possibly. Um, but yeah, lots of dynamic range. Old School Funk and Soul is here. He says, hi, I'm late also. Best to always use a transparent limiter at the end of your chain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and I totally, uh, I, I totally unshameless, completely, I completely shamelessly will promote everything that, that, Ian, uh, that Ian has to bring to the table in terms of music production education because... Um, not only is he a thoroughly consummate um, professional in the business and extremely successful in the business, but he's also a really, really great educator. Uh, and he's he's one of the he's one of the smartest people I know, for sure. Uh, and you know, uh, one of the things he is extremely passionate about is dynamic range and preserving dynamic range in music, so much so that he's created a whole thing called uh, Dynamic Range Day, which happens every year. Uh, and I have been very proud to be a part of, of um, Dynamic Range Day um, for the last four or five years uh, since I discovered that he was doing, that he had in inaugurated it and and uh, and started it as, as a way of um, getting awareness out there about um, dynamic range and loudness. Uh, let's see. Tim says, also with commercials, there's a ton of layers happening within 10 to 30 seconds. Yep. Excellent point. Uh, John says, I just noticed you are working without a troll. I'm not quite sure what you mean. Uh, Tim says, they are still minus 23 LKFS, but dense, immensely dense. Yes. Uh, Snotty says I mute the TV or change the channel when a commercial comes on. <laughs> yeah, I do that as well. During the program, it may be just dialogue at minus 23, but the commercials are dialogue and music and effects smashed together. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, and they certainly do sound an awful lot louder than the regular programming as, you know, as well. I have a friend who worked in uh, programming. He was head of programming for the BBC 
for a while, but he was also a, an excellent musical director of um, uh, a big band that I, I played upright bass in for a wee while, for a couple of years. And uh, and it was him that, that told me all about, you know, hey, do you know why um, commercials are so much louder than programming and he and he told me what it was what it was all about and i was just like ah yeah really doesn't surprise me oh john lake is referring to having no thumbs down oh is that right we don't have a thumbs down yet well that's good uh maybe he's on vacation <laughs> bill says yet yeah Whom, whomever my troll is i don't know i don't know who this individual is i have no desire to know who this individual is other than every time I put out a video or I do a show, um, this individual has to. He he or she feels compelled to hit the dislike button. I don't know whether they watch the content. I don't know. I don't know why they choose to do it, but they choose to do it. Uh, it's It's very bizarre and personally, I think a little bit sad actually, that they feel compelled to engage in this behavior. Uh, and they think that it is somehow going to damage me by them doing it. That somehow I'm going to be upset that somebody dislikes what I do. I'm not upset by somebody disliking my content. I really am not. If people don't like what I have to say, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. There are people in the education industry, in the music education industry, that I don't agree with, that, and I don't like their content. I don't like what they have to talk about. I just move on, frankly. I respect them as professional colleagues, but I don't dislike, I don't hit the dislike button on every video that they put out, because it's stupid. If I don't like what they say, I move on, and I listen to people that I do like. Like Sir, for example. I love his content. <laughs> he puts out some really, really top-notch um, mixing content. Uh, and it's definitely well worth going and checking out his channel, Tim, as well. Tim, uh, Tim's channel is really, really, really good. Uh, he puts out some really, really great mixing um, videos and how-to videos that are very entertaining and I love his thumbnails for his videos. They are hilarious and very engaging. Uh, and he's, he's doing things exactly right. In my opinion, uh, he's really knowledgeable and you should definitely go and check out his stuff and check out his channel for sure. So I says, I always have one thumbs down on my videos too. We may have the same troll. <laughs> it, it may well be, that may well be true. <laughs> Tim says, likes, dislikes, and comments are all the same in the algorithm. Interactions are interactions. Exactly. It doesn't matter what you do. So long as you are engaging in, my, in mine and my friends and my colleagues' content, we appreciate it, whether you like it or dislike it, or whether you have something negative to say or something positive to say. It's, my opinion is it's always better to have something positive to say. If you've got something negative to say... Uh, think about why you're saying it. If you are going to make a constructive and helpful criticism, that's great. I welcome those, and I'm sure Tim and Zah do as well. And I'm sure Dave Vignola does, and Joe Gilder does, and Graham. You know, we all appreciate constructive comments. They're actually going to help us improve the con you know, improve the content that we put out. Absolutely for sure. Um, you know, I don't shy away from it. Uh, but yeah, so long as you're engaging with what I do, that's the important thing. And, you know, as soon as people stop engaging with what I do, um, I will stop making videos. I will stop uh, doing um, shows like this one. I've been doing this show now for, th for every Sunday for about three years now. I've done, let me see. Yeah, it would be three years because I'm, I'm coming close to the 150th uh, Sunday Night Live. 
I think this one is the 144th, I think. I'm going to have to go back and check. But I'm, I'm fairly confident that this is show number 144. Uh, I'm not very good at keeping that kind of data. Joe Gild is much better than, than I am at that because his, um, his podcast, he has an episode number that he keeps a, 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 a close tab on. I'm crap at that. So uh, I, I get to like episode number five and then I've gone, what episode are we on now? <laughs> so that is why I stopped doing that and started just putting the date in instead. So as you'll see, the title uh, down here somewhere is Sunday Night Live, June 21st, 2020. <laughs> it's not imaginative, but it does the job. Anyway, I think we are going to end with that really great uh, little piece of, of topic. So thank you for, for that, actually. I'm um, talking about um, our, our mutual troll. Don't know who the, who this troll is, but whomever you are, um, you know, reach out, reach out and, and talk to me and tell me why you feel compelled to hit the dislike button on every video and every Sunday Night Live that I do. I would love to know. And, you know, maybe I can help. So, uh, until next time, uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. And as John Lake says, great, we got you to go an hour. Yeah, that's because we had like 24 people here at one point. So, and, you know, with Father's Day and everything else, I was not expecting that. Uh, so I appreciate all the likes. I think there's about 15 or 16 of those. I appreciate that, guys. Thank you very, very much. And I appreciate you all sticking with me throughout uh, the show. And uh, we managed to go for the whole hour, which is very, very cool. Um, <laughs> Tony says, I like your work. Just shave yourself. Yeah, uh, this is like two days worth of growth, believe it or not. Uh, and this is because this is just, I just haven't been bothered for the last couple of days, but, uh, yeah, uh, I, I have to shave like twice a day <laughs> to, uh, to keep it all kind of not looking scruffy anyway. So I will see you guys on Wednesday over on Johnny's channel for songwriting simplified. Don't know what we're going to talk about this week. Uh, I will figure that out with Johnny over the course of this week and I'll see you all then and then we'll be back here for uh next sunday show so until then folks i am going to say a very good night good night <laughs>